Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church, and I'm Pastor Don Ayers, and we'd like to invite you to come in for our church service. Come on in. Uh, take your hymnal and turn to page number 214, and let's stand, if you would, please, for the children's offering. <clears throat> You ever consider the title, the, uh, think about the titles of songs, the name, All the Way My Savior Leads Me? What if he did lead you all the way? You'd be caught up short somewhere along the line, hanging out there in outer space somewhere. All the way. I thought Abby would do a special number this morning. <laughs> so I, had, well, Todd and myself usually do them, and Todd says, I ain't got nothing. I says, well, I think Abby's going to sing for us. But she's still setting, so. <laughs> It's amazing, was it your niece, born without the aorta arts and the, who was it, Mike? Mike Kissel. Huh? Mike Kissel's cousin, yeah. Cousin, oh. Uh, 60, if he would have lived, uh, our first son would have been 63, yeah. And he was born that way, but back to 63 years ago, there wasn't a thing they could do about it. It's amazing what modern science has done. But anyway, I'm going to sing. <laughs> Oh, 
singing tonight then, all right? So I'll put you on the spot. Is that all right? Oh, all right. It's doing too nice. Yep. So we're so glad to have the Robinsons with us today. I'm just, I don't want time to go by fast. I want to enjoy it and get ministered to. It's my turn to get preached to, so I look forward to that. And uh, y'all don't get that Sunday morning freeze going on, you hear me? <laughs> Someone turn up the heat or turn the air condition, do something, wake these people up. No. Don't get the Sunday morning freeze going. And... Um, um, loosen up a little bit, so I'm just giving you a hard time. So that's my job, right? That's why I get paid the big bucks. I do, yeah. <laughs> to keep you guys loose. And um, so, thank you for being here today, and thank you for the good Sunday school lesson, lesson, brother Caleb. And uh, prayer always a much. It's one of those most talked about, but the least practiced, and very important, especially in the day which we live in. And uh, Daniel was was a man of prayer, and he went through the most difficult times. Uh, in the Bible and difficult times in the country and um, and we got some of the greatest lessons of prayer because of that so so don't give up keep praying so all right brother Caleb you come have you preached to us looking forward to presenting the ministry yeah, tonight yeah. and thanks for being here today thank you. thank you for obeying God's call yeah thank you for having us all right thank you for letting us come we do appreciate that so uh, that was a good song I appreciate that so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Esther, the book of Esther. <clears throat> Actually, go with me to Luke chapter 15 first. Luke chapter 15. Take it back. Switch it up. Luke chapter number 15. I was debating on whether what to preach this morning, so I decided on this, so if it's bad... Uh, we can change it up. We can do a different one. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, verse number 7. It says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, this has nothing to do with all the stuff that's going on social media about the ninety and nine, but uh, this verse is very important in regards to the fact that each and every one of us at some point were lost. And I thank God that he did find us. You know, He did find me as an individual. and he, he, he died on the cross for each and every one of us. No matter what state we were in, we were still lost sinners in need of repentance. Yeah. And I grew up, like I said, in a Christian home. But growing up in a Christian home, no matter what you think or not think, don't think, makes you no more better of a person than anybody else. You are still a lost, rotten sinner that needs repentance. That does not make you any better than anyone else. I, sometimes we hear a lot of people, especially uh, when you grow up in a Christian home, you know people that have had really cool testimonies. They're like, yeah, I was saved out of this lifestyle, and I came out, and this is what God brought me from. You know, you know what? The littlest sin, the Bible says a lying tongue is an abomination, and I know for a fact that I was a little liar. Yeah. I was an abomination in God's eyes wow. as a Christian. That's in a Christian home as a little Christian kid. But I was an abomination. It goes to show you that we're all the same. We're all saved by grace. We all came from nothing, and God restores us and put us in fellowship with Him when we didn't deserve it, no matter where you're from. So that's just a thought. That not, has nothing really to do with the message. Um, but go with me to Luke, or I mean to Esther chapter 8, if you would. Esther chapter 8. Um, we're going to look at this story. And uh, before we read this verse, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us and the time that we can gather in your house and just worship you and, and learn from your word, Lord. I pray that you would uh, uh, use me to your honor and glory, not for my sake, but that uh, we can just learn something from you, that you'd speak through me, that you'd be honored and glorified in all that's said and done. 
and that you would uh, shine forth your power and your glory. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Just now pray. Amen. Amen. Luke, or I mean Esther, chapter number 8. Let's look at verse number 16 and 17. And uh, we'll read these verses. It says, The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. And uh, this passage, you look at this, and when we look at the story of Esther, we understand how, uh, what all goes on in this story. We understand how Esther becomes the queen, and then how the children of Israel were going to be destroyed. And I want to look at this whole thing in a little bit different light this morning. But this passage, we're looking at the end of the story right now. And when I read story or read books, sometimes, you know, when something really big is about to happen, you go to the end of the book just to make sure that everybody survives and then go back to the end. That's what I used to do. Uh, Just like this old Bible, it's nice that when you go to the end, you can read Revelations. And at the last couple chapters, we're going to be in a new heaven, as he was talking about, New Jerusalem. We got something to look forward to. No matter what the world may do, no matter how the world may act, if anything, all that's been going on has just showed me that he's coming back sometime soon. Uh, People are losing their mind, and he's just making it easier for him to be back. And uh, I'm excited about it. You know, yes, as he said, you know, are you ready? Yes, you're ready to die. I mean, you're ready to go to heaven. But do you want to write the second? Well, that's up to you, I guess. (laughs) Each and every one of us, you know, you answer that in your own way. But this story is a very interesting story. In Esther, we know how this all happens, but I want us to look at it from a little different perspective. And go back with me to Esther chapter number 3. Esther chapter 3, verse number 1, we'll start off with this story. <coughs> and there's going to be a little bit of reading just because there's a whole lot in this book. It says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So Haman has been set up, right? And it says, All the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Now it's kind of funny that they just kept bringing it over. Like nobody, it seems like nobody that's on the other side ever lets anything relax. Right. It's like they just keep bringing up the same thing over and right. over again. It's like whatever. Okay, everybody's moving on. All right, so now it came to pass, er, verse number five. And when Haman saw that, that was free, by the way, sorry. And when Haman saw that, Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Why? Because he wanted all the glory for himself. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Listen to this verse. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So he's saying, I didn't, he didn't want to just take out Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is the one that created the offense here. He's the one that didn't bow down to Haman. Instead of going after just Mordecai, it says, what does it say in that verse? For they had showed him the people of Mordecai, where, wherefore Haman sought to what? To destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. He's like, you know what? I'm going to take them all out. Like, seriously? This is, I mean, some of these things ring, through, ring true today, it seems like. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day, and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. And Haman said unto the king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad, and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. 
Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof, to every people after their language, in the name of the king Hashwares was it written, and sealed with the king's ring. Notice this verse right here. And the letters were sent by posts into the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The posts went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. I want you to notice that word, the posts. You look at this passage, we see here that all the Jews now are to be destroyed. And uh, we understand the story, but I want us to look at this from a little bit different perspective this morning and draw a couple different conclusions out of it. Number one, I want us to understand that there is a conflict. Just as there's a conflict in this passage, what's the conflict? The conflict is the children of Israel are going to die. But there is a conflict in this world today, and there is somebody that is seeking to destroy the entire world. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil is as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, the devil wants to destroy not only Christians, he wants to destroy the lost. You see, if he destroys Christians, he destroys the lost, because there's nothing to help stand in the gap. Now, God uses us as individuals in a great and mighty way, not because we're special, but because He chooses to. Yeah. The Bible says that when the Jews uh, came out of Jerusalem and they were casting their palms down before Christ, remember that? And they were talking about Hosanna, Hosanna. And they're like, why are these people doing that? He said, if they didn't, the rocks would cry out. Yeah. That tells you right now the rocks can do just as good a job as I am right here. <laughs> God uses the donkey. He doesn't need anybody special. He just needs somebody. And so in that, I want us to think about this passage. I want us to draw some conclusions. I want us to look at these Jews, not in the fact that they're God's people, but in the fact that it's just like a lost and dying world. Yeah. It is a people with no hope. These people had nothing to look forward to. They are now getting a decree that they are going to die, and all their kids are going to die, their families are going to die, and everybody's going to get everything they own. And we look at the lost and dying world today, there is a decree from the king in heaven that anybody that rejects him is going to die and spend an eternity in hell. Yeah. And there's a person that's in this world today, we know that Satan is moving and trying to destroy others. He causes destruction, he causes mayhem. You don't think that what's going on today isn't part of Satan's plan? He is the prince of this world. Yeah. It's, it caters all to what he's doing. Yeah. Doesn't mean that God's not on the throne. Let's not forget that. God is giving him a time. If you look at the book of Revelations, what happens during the tribulation, God gives Satan free reign, not because he can't do anything, but because he chooses to. Yeah. And so we understand that, but we see that there's a conflict for this world. There is a lost and dying world that is needing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's a gospel, that message, that needs to be presented. But first, there has to be a calling. Number one, there's a conflict, but number two, there's a calling. If you look in uh, Esther chapter 4, we're going to kind of just work through this entire story. And it says in verse number uh, 1, And when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, and take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. So we see here that Mordecai is in distress, 
And he's calling out and he's looking for somebody to help him in this situation. He realizes that there's going to be destruction of these people and he's looking for someone to help. He's not in a place of authority. He's not anybody at this point. And if you look in verse number 5, Esther calls to him and then it uh, keep going. It says in verse number 7, And Mordecai, I told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave them the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. So she's been called now. There's a calling out of her to do a duty for her people, to make a stand in a time that is very difficult. You know, he looked at what was going on, Mordecai did, and he said, you know what, there's one person that can make this happen. And he says, you know what, Esther, I need you to do something. And it's interesting when you look at the story, it, uh, it goes and you keep reading, it says in verse number 10, And Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. She's saying, I, I understand that I'm in a great position, but it doesn't matter. If the king doesn't call me in, I can't do the job. Because as soon as I walk in there, he's going to kill me. And it's interesting that she's been called for a purpose, and at the same time, when she's been called for this purpose, she's saying, I can't do the job. And I know in my own personal life, God calls me to do something. And when God called me to do something, I gave excuses. That's like the first thing. How many of you Christians have ever been like that? Yeah. God calls you to do something. The first thing you do is like, I, I can't go there. <laughs> I mean, when you're out soul winning, one of the first excuses that you have, especially when somebody, you knock on somebody's door, is if it's like a real big guy, you're just like, you know, when I was a kid, especially you have this big biker guy and you're trying to witness to him and you're like, come to my church, you're scared to death, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you, you give excuses of why you can't do something. You're always scared to do something for God, right? <laughs> it's that uncertainty. Nobody likes uncertainty. We all like what, we like to have some type of schedule. Whether you're unscheduled or not scheduled, you still like a schedule, there's still something about having a job tomorrow. How many of you guys would ever be like, okay, I'm cool with, uh, you know, getting laid off today and then not having a job tomorrow and then having a job tomorrow and then getting laid off the next. Nobody likes that. And I think that's why it's such a challenge for us as Christians when we have to follow God because God wants us to literally lay everything aside and take that next step. And you have no idea what the future is going to hold. And she's like, I don't know about this. Mordecai, why don't you do it? It doesn't sound like a real good plan. She's like, I'm going to die. I keep noticing this passage. I find this very interesting. Good. Keep going. It says in verse number 12, And they told Mordecai Esther's words. And then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, I love this, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. He's like, you really think you're that much better than everybody else? Once they find out who you are, you're going to die. And he's like, verse number thir uh, 13, uh, or verse number uh, 14, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yeah. You realize he calls, God calls people in certain situations. He understands the predicaments. Just as he was talking about Daniel. Daniel was called to do certain things. He went through so many different kings. But he always kept his path right. He always followed God. But even in all that, there's always that uncertainty. But he's saying, you really think that no matter where you're at, it's just going to be all right. 
Christian, the lost and dying world, the biggest problem is Christians because we don't want to follow. The calling's been made. We've all been commanded. If you look at the, uh, the Great Commission, there's nobody, it doesn't say in there, pastors. It doesn't say in there, missionaries. Each and every individual has a part and a place and a duty to reach someone. God called us to do something great. And I think sometimes we're seeing what's going on in America. We see what goes on in the world. And it's because God called us out to do something for such a time as this. And we're standing there saying, I'm not called. <laughs> Just as she was kind of given an excuse, we can give her a hard time. But we're not getting called to die. You may be getting called to die to self. But you're not getting called to die. He just wants you to serve. Yeah. He just wants us to do something. Each and every one of you as an individual, we, like I told uh, in Sunday school, we live in a very small town. Uh, well, we don't even live in town, but we live next to a small town. <laughs> There's 400 people in our town. And uh, so because of that, we have, uh, everybody knows who you are. That's just how it is. And everybody's related. So uh, just like this brother was talking about his, his cousin's, daughter's son yeah that happens all the time so for us in our church we we have a lot of people that know everyone or are related to somebody that goes to the church it's just how it is and so because of that you have to be very careful in how you approach people or how you approach things or who the, that you interact with that you interact in the right way because they know who you are and they'll be like oh yeah you're from that church i know you and uh so we when we first started deputation um a lady that's from the town over, there's a newspaper for the entire county. She goes and she says, hey, I would like to do an interview with you guys going to Sandy. I was like, okay, you know, well, that's cool. So we did this, we did this interview, and we got to talk, and they took a picture of us, and they put us in the beacon. Well, we're in a small town, okay? Well, so everybody knows who you are, and they're all like, you run into people in the grocery store, they're like, oh, yeah, how's Africa? You know what I mean? It's, it's weird. Um, <laughs> But it goes to show you that our impact is such a, in such a way that you are reaching people whether you know it or not. Yeah. And, and you as individuals here in this area, a farming community in this area, I'm sure that you have people that you run across in a daily basis that you're going to reach, that their only presentation of Jesus Christ is the fact that you come. Yeah. There may be a clerk, a grocery clerk, that may check your groceries out every time you come to the store. And the only thing she knows about your church is you. So she knows that you came in cussing somebody out on the phone that day before. <laughs> you know, your impact is great. You have met somebody that their only presentation of Jesus Christ is yourself. Yeah. Have you shamed the name of Christ? The calling is great. And it's easy for us to give excuses. But there's, it's not a time to give excuses. God says... You're put in this position. You are put here on this earth. You are in this church right now for such a time as this. Yeah, good. You are here for one reason and one reason only, to glorify God. Yeah. It says in verse number 15, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. She doesn't keep arguing. And sometimes Christians, if we would just like move on and not argue with God, it would probably be a little easier. It says, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink these three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now talk about commitment. She just came from the point that she's like, you know what? I'm probably going to die if I go in there. I don't think I need to be doing this right now. Mordecai, you're crazy. And he says, no. You're here for a reason. You're here to do something for God. You're here to save your people. Do it. And she says, okay, if I die, I die. Talk about commitment. Like, it was, I, I like to look at a glass half full. So I'm a little bit more positive. I'm like, couldn't there have been something else? Like, you know, hopefully they just throw me in jail or something like, you know, like, no, she says, if I die, I die. That is commitment to a cause that she believed was real. And Christians, if we are truly committed 100% to Jesus Christ, we can do something. Yeah. 
if we would approach a lost and dying world with the thought, if, if I perish, I perish for the cause of Christ, this world could be reached. Your town, your community could be reached. Yes, your personal testimony or your personal uh, power in a community or an area may be gone. It may perish. But if there's people who reach for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's worth it all. It's worth giving up the things of this world. They're just temporal. They don't matter. It's just if you perish, you perish. And the third point is, we see here, now there's a challenge. You know, sometimes as Christians, we forget, too, that we're like, we're like well, she's been or we understand there's an issue. She's been called. Now there's follow-through. There's been a lot of Christians that have been called but never followed through. Yeah. You see here, now there's a challenge. She has to do something. Verse number 5 of verse, uh, chapter five of verses, uh, chapter five, verses one through five. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat on his upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Now, imagine this. You know for a fact that if he does not hold that out, he's holding it in his hand. All he has to do is hold it out. You know for a fact that if he doesn't hold it out, you're dead. That's it. Done. Could you imagine the wave of relief that came across her as she sees that thing come down? Yeah. Okay. Whew. Fantastic. And then she has to go up to the thing that she's dreading and touch it like... The, the amazing thing, the amount of commitment that this woman had in order to do something to save her people. I mean, the follow-through that it took. Just a little bit extra effort, just a little bit of initiative. And it says here in verse number three, three Ned said the king unto Esther, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. So she says, You tell me anything you want, and you can have half the kingdom if you want. I will give you everything you want. No matter, she just walked in just to make a request. And he says, you know what? You want half my kingdom? Cool. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I mean, God obviously is doing something here. So did she blow it in verse number four? And Esther answered, if it seemed good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. You're like, what in the world here? Okay, this is your time to come out, do something amazing. You're saving your people. Boom, everything's solved. You have all the power now. And all of a sudden, you're going to say, hey, come to my banquet. <laughs> and I'm like, you look at that story, you're like, seriously, is this a joke? Like, what, did she forget what she's supposed to be doing? She just fasted three days. Sometimes, and I know for myself, you know, when you're, especially when you're younger, you always want everything to happen now. It's like fast, fast, fast. We live in America, I like to call it like a fast food society. Yeah. It's just how we are. It's our, it's our mindset. You go overseas in Zambia, psh, it's manana. It's always the next day. It's, <laughs> there's always, okay, we'll be there. Two hours later, they finally show up. You've done 15 other things other than what you're supposed to do. And then you finally get to what you're going to do. It's just a different mindset. And she, she hears, she says, hey, come to my banquet. Verse number five. Then the king said, cause Haman to make haste that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther prepared. So you see this, that she's been called out. She's supposed to do something great. She has the opportunity. And now she's saying, okay, come to my banquet. So you keep looking at the story. But I want you to notice something if you keep reading. Look at verse, or chapter number 6, verses 1 through 3. If she had done it according to how we wanted things to happen, or how things would we perceive things should be, God wouldn't be able to do his work. Look at verse number 1. On that night could not the king sleep. And he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Because she has the banquet, and then she tells him to come to another banquet. Like, she still doesn't bring the issue up, okay? So, sorry, I skipped that part. But verse number two. And it was found written that Mordecai, 
had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. Three, and the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Look at this. So she goes, she says, have a banquet. We're going to have the banquet. They come to the banquet. She says, okay, come again tomorrow. I'm going to have another one. And we're like, why is she still not bringing this issue up? But chapter number six, the king goes to bed and can't sleep. And then all of a sudden, Mordecai's name comes up. If you don't believe that's the hand of God, I don't know what is. You see, sometimes we want things to happen in such a way in our lives, and, and there's a, I was talking to another pastor about this, and we were, there was doors that we wanted open in Zambia. There was things, there was opportunities that we wanted for us to do and for those doors to be just perfect to walk through. And it seemed like the door just kept shutting on this one, position, this one opportunity. And I was like, why in the world? And God kept shutting it, kept shutting it, kept shutting it. We'd been dealing with it for nine months. And I'm like, now, what is going on? And then God finally opens another door, and he says, hey, this door is the door I want you to go through. But you're so blindsided, and you're so set on one direction all the time, God wants to take you another direction, and you refuse to go through that door because this door looks like it's the door you're supposed to go through. I just want to challenge to my mindset, and just like this, you look at the story, and we're like, we're going to do it. She could have pried that door open and taken off and just done what she had done, and maybe the king would not have been even receptive to hear what she had to hear, what she had to say. But God was able, she gave God time in the background to move. And the Holy Spirit starts to work in people's lives. The king's heart softened already towards Mordecai. So now he wants to do something great for Mordecai, even though he's not what was supposed to be taken care of. He's supposed to be killed. So you can't do something great for the guy and then all of a sudden kill him the next day. So obviously something God's doing something here. God wants to move in people's lives, and you may be reaching somebody or trying to reach somebody, and you keep trying to kick that door open, and God just hasn't opened it yet. Maybe we haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. I'm not saying giving it up on somebody. But sometimes the Holy Spirit just needs to work. God has to call them. We're not Calvinist, but at the same time, we could use with a little bit of understanding that God needs to do something. Yeah. We cannot force anybody to follow him. And God wanted to do something great in these people's lives. And God wants to do something great in your life or those around you. And if you try to kick the door open all the time, it's never going to open. There has to be that patience and that waiting period. Like we said, God's timeline is always perfect. Yeah, did Fraser really want his daughter healed right away? Yes. But his daughter still healed. His timing was perfect. The door in Zambia, did I want it to be open when I wanted it to be open? Yes. But his timing's perfect. Yeah. I had to humble myself and realize that it's not me. It's not what I want, it's what God wants. You're going to be like, well, brother, you're a missionary. You're supposed to have this all figured out. I'm telling you right now, I ain't. <laughs> I do not have it all figured out. I make mistakes every day. And there's times that I still am struggling to figure things out sometimes. And I think if you come to the point and think that you've got it figured out, you better take a step back because you don't have it figured <laughs> out. Right. We all are growing in Christian life. Yes. We all have steps to take. The Christian walk does not end till you're taken home. That's it. Your Christian walk is still growing day by day. I don't care if you're retired or not. Right. Your walk is not over. Right. You still have a walk to make and a step to take and somebody to follow or somebody to lead. Yeah. Good. And so we see here in this passage that God begins to work in this people's lives. Verse number se In chapter number 7, then we're like, okay, now she's getting from somewhere. So the king and Haman came to the banquet, which Esther the queen, and the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Again, he says it, you know, she could have half the kingdom. Now, could have been interesting. 
What if she had this point, Christian, let's be honest now. What if at this point she had said, you know what, I want half the kingdom. And just taken the kingdom and just had whatever she wanted in life. She could have had a perfect life. She could have had whatever she wanted. She could have said, forget all my people. Forget all those things. Forget about a lost, those that are going to die. I'm taking what I want now. Now, Christian, how often have we done that in our own lives? I know for a fact, for many years, I did. I said, forget about a lost and dying world. I'm going to follow the money. I want what I want now. Have we done that? Have we been offered the things of this world? We could have had it. You know, it's interesting when we look at Solomon. What did Solomon say? God said, ask whatever you want from me, and you can have whatever you want. And Solomon said, what? I want wisdom. And God said, because you asked for wisdom, I will give you all those other things. Because you realized and understood that those things aren't what matters. Christian, if we had been, most of us, let's be honest, how many of us, if God had said, hey, you guys can have whatever you want, how many of you guys would have been like, yeah, I want wisdom? (laughs) I'm telling you right now, most of you would have been like, okay, I want a Cadillac. I want about 15,000 acres, you know, a mountain, and, you know, as many fishing boats as possible, you know. We would, we would want things for our flesh. We would want to consume it on ourselves. She has the opportunity to consume all this upon herself. She could have walked away from everything and said, you know what, I'm going to change my petition. I'm going to do what I want. We have many times been called by God to do something, and we change our minds in the middle of the calling because it doesn't fit with what we want to do now. And God still says the calling is still the same. The people are still dying, and there's still lives to be saved. But she goes on and says, Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. And you're like, what does that mean? She's saying, hey, I'm going to die because she's revealing revealing who she is. The king did not know she was a Jew. It says in verse number four, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king of Hasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? He must have forgot that he gave this guy this commandment. I mean, he must have been busy, you know. Just funny. He's like, Who is this guy? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Yeah. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Now to think about this, she not only took a stand, but she took a stand with the very man in the room uh, that was promised to kill her. Yeah. I mean, talk about amazing commitment. Yeah. Verse number seven, and the king arising from the banquet of wine and his wrath went into the plate palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther, the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. He was like, okay, I'm doomed. Verse number nine, and Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, behold, also the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, which, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him thereon. So they hang Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Amen. You're like, wow, what a crazy story. Yeah. That all of a sudden, through all this, God's trying to do something. There was a challenge that she'd been placed in. She's supposed to do something. And she's made this statement. She stood up for her people. But it doesn't end here. The story doesn't end here. Because those same posts that had already rode out are still out there. There is nobody knows that there is hope. A lost and dying world does not know that there is hope. They do not know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. You go into Zambia, there's Jesus. They'll have Jesus on their walls. They have Jesus everywhere. They believe they're a Christian nation. But you ask them who Jesus is, and they have no clue. They do not know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them in their sins. They understand that Jesus died, and they understand he rose again. But they do not understand why he died, and it was because of them that he went to the cross. They don't understand it. 
just like this, a lost and dying world here, these people had no clue that their lives had been saved. They have no clue. Nothing has happened. That's why verse chapter number eight is probably one of the most important pas- or chapters in this whole passage. It says verse number or chapter eight, verses one through nine. On that day did King Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, and the device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king, and said, If it please the king... And if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, of the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Now, verse 4, I kind of read through it fast, I'm sorry. Notice what verse 4 says. She had to go back before the king, and the king had to hold that scepter out again. But you realize she had already walked through that valley one time. And she wasn't so nervous to go through it again. God may take you through a trial only to be a help to somebody else in another trial. Uh, Just like Frazier, I was talking about him earlier. He lost a son several years ago. Uh, He died when he was a baby. In Zambia, if a baby is under three months, they do not bury him. They do not have a funeral. They just take him out back. They don't believe they're a human being. And so... It was a big deal. They had one of the first funerals in the bush for his son. And it was a very big deal. And it caused a huge lot of conflict, a bunch of conflict with his family. And he said, no, this is right. This is a human being. He's in heaven with God right now. And they said, okay. And he, he fought it with his family for a while. Well, just recently in his church in the lake there, his deacon lost his son. Um, I believe it was four days old. And the baby passed away. So they had a funeral. First funeral in that village, in that area of Zambia, for a baby, ever. They never had one before. And he said, it had been, it caused a huge stink in the village. They were very upset. Because they don't, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cultural customs with that. They believe the wife won't have another baby afterwards. There's a lot of things that are very, very funky in their mindset. It's just culture, it's just been tradition that they've had for years and years and years power of Satan is real, and he has deceived people, yes. and he uses it to control them. The only reason why Satan can control people is because he uses ignorance against them. Yes. Christians, we shouldn't be deceived by Satan because we shouldn't be ignorant, but we are a lot of times because we don't get in his word. We don't understand what the Bible says. We don't understand what God's doing, yes. and we refuse to have that, and so because of our ignorance, Satan uses it against us, just like these people, and so because of that, he was able to have a service in that village. And those people there, they got to see a baby actually have a funeral, first one there. And you talk about what a challenge that could be. But, you know, God put him through his own trial in his life and placed him in that in his life so that he could guide his own congregation later on. And it made it such a great impact and a great opportunity to preach the gospel in that village people would never listen to before yeah Yeah, was it ideal no we look at things that happen in our lives and we're like why does it have to happen because god is trying to do something different hindsight's always 2020 it's always easy to see the road afterwards and he looks at that and he's like yeah now i understand why at the time he struggled with it in that village it's interesting when you look back at history i was in zambia and I was in that village preaching. We were getting ready to have a program. And uh, he was looking through the Pastor Dave, who was the missionary there at the time. He was looking through his iPad, getting something for it. And there was the picture of his son on there. And in that village, he came up to me and, and he, he, was, he was weeping and so discouraged about losing his son. And he was talking about it, and we, we, we talked about it, and we're like, you know, God's going to, we understand that God's ways are perfect. And, you know, I tried to encourage him a little bit. And, and I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have a kid. Now I do. And, you know, I really understand for him now more so than I did then. 
you know, as a young man, you just like, you just try to throw scripture at everything. It doesn't always, you know, <laughs> scripture's good. I'm not saying it's not, but it, it's very hard, you know. And I look at that now in that same village, in that same place where he broke down and God broke him right there on that spot about his son. It's the same village that he gets to be there presenting the gospel to a bunch of people because of what happened there. Who would have thought that that would have happened, that I would have been there during that time, that he would have lost his son? Who would have ever thought any of that would happen? Talk about God's timetable being amazing. Yeah. Talk about God's hand moving in the backgrounds. And so we see this story. God's still trying to do something here. In verse number 6, it says, For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto the people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Verse 7, Then the king of Hasuera said unto Esther the queen, and to Mordecai, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name, and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. He's saying, what I've done is still going to happen, unless you reverse it. By writing a new commandment. We look at scriptures and we understand that there's a lost and dying world that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we know the king's commandment from heaven is that the lost world will spend an eternity in hell. But God also wrote right after that commandment, he said that he loved the world so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Yeah. He rewrote the commandment That's good. and gave hope to a lost and dying world. I mean, how, how amazing, when you look at the story, how amazing is the transition here that you can see. But it doesn't stop there, because just even if he rewrites it, it doesn't matter. It says, Then were the king's scribes called at the time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the th three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written, According to the all that Mordecai I commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and hundred and twenty and seven provinces, Unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. And he wrote in the king of Hashuarah's name, and sealed it with the king's ring, and sent letters by what? What's that word that I told you to remember earlier? Hosts. On horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. Keep reading, it says, verse number 14. So the post that rode upon mules and camels went out, what, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan the palace. Those posts were the only thing holding an entire nation from destruction. Esther had done her job. Everybody had done their job, but it still came to the fact that those guys that were on those mules and horsebacks Imagine if one guy said, you know what, I feel like I'm tired today, I'm just not going to do nothing, and never reached a village that he was supposed to reach to. You realize how huge this kingdom is, Ethiopia to India. People don't realize how big Africa is. Africa is an absolutely monstrous continent. I mean, it's huge. The country of Zambia, if you look on a map, doesn't look like it's very big. It's bigger than the state of Texas. So imagine all those African countries about the size of Texas on there. Well, you have 15 states the size of Texas. Okay, you've done blown past the U.S. already. Everybody, everybody that lives in Texas always thinks it's bigger and better in Texas. <laughs> my my brother-in-law is from Texas, and we always give each other a hard time. Uh, and so, but yes, if you're from Texas, I'm sorry. I've been there. I lived there. I've done that. Uh, but yes. It's interesting when we look at that. So imagine how big this is. India is a huge continent as well. They're covering huge amounts of ground. There's a lot of people with a very specific job to do something. Yeah. But these posts, uh, they're very interesting how they go. The first thing they did was they declared the bad news, right? They were nothing. They were just told just to go out and do something. You know, the Bible says that before salvation, we were what? The sons of, sons of Satan. We, we, were, we were nothing. And God changes our message, changes our roles, changes our lives, and has us carry out a new commandment, a new king's commandment, and now we are the messengers of God yeah. into a lost and dying world. And you're a post here today 
to declare something. Jesus Christ already paid the price. The sacrifice has already been done. Everything is taken care of. All we have to do is take the message. The king's commandment is clear. That's point number four is the commandment. The last point is, is the in Esther chapter 9. Well, go back to verse number 16. We looked at it already. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Verse 17, and in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. Yeah. You realize there was only joy and gladness when Jesus Christ is in our lives? Yeah. There's only joy and gladness when a lost and dying world is reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that's why I went to that verse. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repented. There's only going to be a celebration in heaven and on this earth when we have done our job. The Jews only had joy and gladness because the post made it. They came with the message. They heard the good news. And many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. You realize it had a greater impact. Not only were their lives saved, other lives were saved. You know, they became Jews, and we understand how the Old Testament works when they became a proselyte. I mean, they, they were sealed into the Israeli fold. No matter where they were from, once you understand history, how, how God opened that door for them, if they truly became a Jew, they talked about a lot of sacrifice on their part. You know, a lost and dying world, they can be reached, and their lives can be completely transformed because the Pope did their job. Last verse, 21 through 23 of chapter 9. To establish this among them, and it's talking about, well, verse 20. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar, the 15th day of the same yearly, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy. You know, there's a loss of dying world. It's a sorrowful thing to see people lost and going to hell. But there's joy when they repent and they accept Jesus Christ and they can go to heaven. And from morning into a good day, and they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and of gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun, as Mordecai had written unto them. Someday, one day in heaven, we will all get to sit down the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to get to eat together with saints from all across the world. Imagine that. You guys will get to meet people in Africa that have been reached. You'll get to see them. They'll get to meet you. They'll be like, hey, thank you for supporting some missionaries that came over here and talked about it. Talked about Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending a post you know, we're going to get to have a great celebration in heaven, but there's only going to be a celebration if we do our job. If the posts go out. So I challenge you today, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are a post. There's no, there's no way to get around it. You've already been called. You've already been set out. You don't have a choice. Just do the job. We're trying to do our job in Africa. We still have opportunities here. I've been able to witness to some people here recently. Have they gotten saved right away? No. It's one of those things that's going to take time. Yeah. But you still have an opportunity. Yeah. People's lives are hanging in a balance. And we have both the commandments. Let's take it to them and tell them what Jesus Christ did for them. Well, thank you, brother. That concludes our worship services today. We'd like to thank you so much for tuning in and watching us on live stream. And we personally like to give you an invite to our church. Uh, if you're out there and uh, you don't have a place that you call home, if you don't have a, uh, a local church to attend, we'd love to have you. And we want to give you a personal invite and come meet us in person. Uh, so thank you once again for watching. And we sure hope you got a blessing from the message that the Lord gave us today. And if there's never been a time in your life where you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, 
We pray that you might take this opportunity after hearing this message and invite the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart and accept him the best way you know how as your personal Savior so you can know for sure that heaven's your home when you die. So thanks again for tuning in. Um, this is our uh, uh, home Facebook page uh, at Liberty Baptist. And also you can um, see us at libertybaptistada.com.